Hello, it's me, Johanna, and I'm back here today to teach you about Business Management 5.3. Again, I'm going to remind you, I do not have any credentials. However, I have studiously read the Business Management book and paid attention in my classes. So hopefully this will be accurate. So 5.3 is about lean production and quality management. So lean production is all about minimizing waste. Now, when you think of waste, you probably think of the scraps of a product you're making, like the leftovers. However, in this sense, waste refers to all waste. So that is a waste of time, waste of money, waste of material, waste of resources. You have to think in a more broader sense. Essentially, you have to think about the company as a whole, like all of the functions of a business. You have to think from the finance perspective, from the operations management perspective, from the HR perspective. You might be wasting someone's talent. That is also an option. So essentially that's that. And also just a side note, almost everything we're going to be talking about today was invented in Japan. So there are going to be certain phrases that are originally Japanese, like Kaizen or Andon or, you know, stuff like that. So that's just something to keep in mind because we'll be saying words that you've probably never heard before, and that's because they're Japanese. So lean production was first uh, used by Toyota, the car company, again, Japanese, and essentially you're supposed to be as efficient as possible. The least amount of transportation, the least amount of time, the least amount of space, the least amount of energy, and the least amount of cost. And you also don't want to waste talent. So those are the main aspects to think about when you're talking about lean production. So what are the methods you can use to achieve lean production? So there are four main things we will be discussing in this video. Those are Kaizen, which is a type of thinking, like a way of thinking. Um, then there is Kanban, Andon, and just in time. So we'll begin with Kaizen. So Kaizen, as I said, is a way of thinking. It's a mindset and it means continuous improvement. Essentially, you are trying to come up with new ways to be more efficient. So some aspects of Kaizen are that it's inclusive. Essentially, all of your employees have to be able to have a say in to share ideas and also to make decisions and stuff like that. So to have Kaizen thinking, you need a democratic leadership style. So for instance, an autocratic leadership style most likely wouldn't work. Autocratic means when the top of the hierarchy, like a small group of people at the top of the business, they make all the decisions. In a democratic leadership, everybody has the chance to make decisions. Now, there also needs to be a sense that you can't blame any individual if their idea goes wrong. If people keep getting the blame for different things, you won't be able to foster a creative and comfortable environment where all the employees feel like they can share. You also need a systematic thinking, and that means that you have to be a team. You have to be loyal and you have to be motivated to work in a place like this because you are constantly a part of the process. You're not just clicking a button, you're thinking of new ideas, you're improving. You're thinking about the process and not the end product. The, your main goal is to improve the process. So you want to use less time, less transportation, less, you know, as I was saying before. And it's not really about the end product at all. So the next method is using the just-in-time way of thinking. So before there used to be uh, the just-in-case way of thinking, which is essentially to hoard, not hoard, okay, hoard is an extreme word, but like keep, spare, and extra material just in case demand randomly increases. Now, just in time is more about making sure that things like the materials you need gets to deliver to you only when you need them. So you only order four wheels if you're making one car. You don't order like 10 just, you know, for the next couple cars. So buffer stock refers to the stock that you keep uh, when or in case of unexpected demand. So essentially when I say avoid just in case, that means that you should have no buffer stock. You know, you're not keeping anything just in case. So you need to have stock control. This also leads to the fact that you will need less space because you're not keeping all of this material that you're not currently using. So your stock will reduce a lot. And also you will use less money because if you don't need um, that much space, you won't have to rent out bigger places.
So kanban, which is also a Japanese word, means uh, a signaling system between different steps of the process, which will reduce the amount of time, like the amount of wasted time and wasted resources. It will also cause a steady flow. So your products will be moving in a steady flow. So you might be wondering where the word Kanban came from. So Kanban was literally a card that was released by one machinery to the next to basically start off the process, like trigger the next process when you have enough material to do it. Um, so here's a drawing. It's a really bad drawing. But let's say you have a product and you need three products for machine number two to actually make the final product. So instead of machine number two taking each product one by one, machine number two instead waits for all three products to be done from machine number one to then start machine number two. So there's like a trigger that happens. So the last method to create lean production that we will be discussing is andon. So this, again, another Japanese term. This one is a signaling system as well that shows the health status in the process or of the process and uh, what this essentially means is uh, that if something goes wrong you will have a system that tells you oops this part is wrong so everybody can directly go there and fix the problem and um, it'll be very something very simple for instance like a red light will go off or like an alarm will start playing when like something goes wrong so you can you know, notify people when the problem occurs and everything goes pretty smoothly and quickly because you save um, talent and time. You know, these people don't have to waste their time um, looking at the machines to like maintain them and instead they can go look at them when there actually is a problem. So this is just something that is mentioned in the book that is currently happening in the world, which is cradle to cradle design and manufacturing. So essentially this is when you're thinking about the environment. So essentially recycling, because usually you say like cradle to grave, but instead this is cradle to cradle, like as in like it continues being used forever and ever, you know, essentially that's what the name means. So yeah, you want to be environmentally sustainable. So there is a criteria to be considered a cradle to cradle business. Um, and this criteria has to do with how you're actually recycling, um, the amount of energy necessarily for necessary for the recycling process, which ideally use renewable energy, the amount of water needed, and um, how much responsibility your company is taking. So essentially, are you ethical and like all that stuff? You know, you're using fair labor laws. So the next and last part of 5.3 is all about quality management. So first we have to go through what is quality. So when a product is of quality, you think about these factors. So it is reliable. It's not going to break down. It is safe. You can use it without getting hurt, you know, essentially. Durable. It is going to last for a long amount of time. It's innovative. It is doing something new, something that has not been done before. It is fixing a problem that you have. Um, and you're getting value for money. So you're getting what you're paid for. The advertisement is correct. You know, it's not misleading. You're getting what you paid for. Yeah. So that's essentially what something being of quality means. So what is the importance of quality for a producer? So if your product is perceived as having quality, and, you know, it doesn't always have to be the case. It's honestly... As long as you are perceived as having quality, then everything is good. So you increase sales. You can have more loyal customers. Like, they'll come back and they'll buy the same thing again and again. There are reduced costs, and you can use premium pricing. Because your customers do want products that are of quality. So, next we're going to be talking about the difference between quality control and quality assurance. So this essentially is a change that occurred in the world. Usually it used to be quality control. Now it's more quality assurance. And this is because of a theorist called W. Edwards Demings. So I'm not sure whether you actually have to know his name or not, but it says in the book, so I'm just going to say it again, W. Edwards Demings. Okay. So what is the difference between control and assurance? So essentially in control, 
you are having one person check the quality after the production is over. So one person checks the final product. Meanwhile, in assurance, you have not one person, you have the whole business constantly checking control throughout the process. So in control, there is also um, a certain percentage of like rejected or rejection rate. So essentially, uh, for example, 5% of our products are going to malfunction. Uh, meanwhile, in assurance, there is a zero rejections rate that is expected. Every pot product is supposed to work. Um, there is wasteful production in control. Meanwhile, there's lean production in assurance. And also in assurance, the quality includes both the suppliers and also the like after sales servicing. Um, meanwhile, in control, it only includes like the actual product or service itself. There is also usually an autocratic leadership in control. Meanwhile, there's a democratic leadership in assurance. For quality assurance to work effectively, you actually need to change your approach. You need to start using a Kaizen approach, which again means continuous improvement. So now, how do you achieve total quality management? So this includes a lot of different things. So one thing you can do is to have quality circles. So quality circles is basically when a, a formal group of volunteers um, who meet, regular, meet regularly to discuss and suggest ways to improve quality. Then there is benchmarking, which is setting up standards for, for yourself, which are usually compared to your competitors. So essentially you're like, I want to use, my competitor uses this much money their budget is this so I want to use this or less you know you're setting up different standards that you have to meet then there is quality chain this is making sure to check every part of the chain so for instance there has to be quality in your supplier and also quality in your after sales services there is statistical process control. Essentially, this is just monitoring all stages of production and showing them to all of the parties involved in easy to understand diagrams, charts, or you know statistics messages. So you're just making the communication easier for people to understand. You might want a mobilized workforce. This is essentially making every single employee feel pride in their work and you give them recognition and responsibility so that they feel more motivated. An example of this is like having the employee of the month type of thing. Um, the last thing you might want to use is market-oriented production. This is essentially doing market research so that you are focusing on what the customer wants because then you can, you know, use innovation and all this stuff to improve sales and brand loyalty. So all of these are features that might be mentioned as the total quality management. So you have to not just think of the product itself, but all of the processes that surround the product. So some of the advantages to using lean production and total quality management is that it can create closer working relationships with all of the stakeholders. So this can also include the suppliers and the customers because you're thinking in a more holistic way. It can motivate your workers because they have more responsibilities. It can reduce costs, you know, because you're not wasting space or transportation and therefore avoiding the costs that are related to that. It can improve the design and production of the quality products because you know more what your customer wants and so on and so forth. And it can enhance the reputation of your company. If you are seen as a company that has quality, you can do so many more things. You can use higher prices and such. So there are also disadvantages as well. It can be costly, especially in the short term, because you're going to have to either maybe hire new or train new staff and stuff like that because they have to fit with the new corporate culture. And this can be very time consuming to like create that corporate culture. It can also create a lot of stress on formal relationships because now you're going to be working more closer together and in a different way than before. It's not autocratic. It's not just like, 
I am here, I follow orders, I do my work, da da da. It's more you're enjoying what you're doing, so it can sort of stress that. And it is difficult to maintain over a long period of time because it takes a lot of energy from each person. So obviously there are different national and international quality standards because obviously different countries have different views and like da 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 da, different customers want different things, la da 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 da, you know, all of that stuff. However, there are some reasons why it's very favorable to listen both to the national but also to the international quality standards because you will enable exports, um, so essentially you'll have an easier time moving into different countries because you are already following their standards. Um, you give a competitive edge, aka you're opening up to new markets, all of that stuff. You save on costs of withdrawing products because obviously if you don't meet the international quality standards, you might have to withdraw a bunch of products if you send it over there. It can act as an insurance and it also could bring better profit margins because obviously then you are globally or generally going to be seen as a more like a company with a better reputation. So that was it for 5.3. Thank you so much for watching. Please feel free to subscribe, like, and comment. I would appreciate it a lot. I will be making many more videos. You can follow me at Johanna Frenert if you want on Instagram. And goodbye. I hope you learned something.